I'm so happy I can be today with you here. And I would like to speak with all of you and with specifically with you about your methodology because it's a fascinating topic. And uh, it started for me in 2012 when I saw your first video and read your first book. And I understood that you developed something magnificent, which enables people to speak about the political system of Islam instead of the Islam as a religion. Uh, the fascination went further and I contacted you in 2014 and we together established the Center for the Study of Political Islam International, CSPII. Can you speak more about your methodology, specifically about the subject of political Islam and the term of political Islam? Well, September 11th, 2001 was a busy day because not only did we have the attack on the World Trade Towers, my phone began to ring off the wall with people saying, you said something was going to happen. Matter of fact, 12 people called me on that day. They said, how did you know? I didn't say September 11, 2001, but I said, well, the reason I knew was I read the playbook. So I decided that this had to be my approach in dealing with Islam, is to tell the people about the playbook. That is, most people look at Islam and can't understand it at all, but once you read their doctrine, it's very simple to understand. It's very easy to, to predict what they're going to do. So that was what I decided to do, was to make a series of textbooks that gave a systemic approach to the doctrine of Islam. The idea of a doctrine of Islam wasn't even popular at the time I did this, because most people just thought that Allah, Islam was simply a religion based on Allah and the Quran. So I started out reading the Quran, but I quickly realized that I needed to do something other than read the Quran, because the Quran has 89 times in verses it says that everybody is to imitate their life after Muhammad. If you know much about Islam and you read the Quran, you realize there's not enough in here to practice the religion of Islam. For instance, you're supposed to pray how many times a day? Well, the Quran says three times a day, but the Hadith say five. So what we wanted to do was to study the doctrine. It also became clear to me that there's really only two experts that know about Islam. There's Quran, Allah, and Muhammad. Those are the only two people that know anything about Islam. But you have to understand Muhammad and Allah before you can use what they teach you. So that was what my goal was, was to make the doctrine of Islam simple. I had the intellectual goal of making it so a plumber or a bus driver could read the Quran, Sirah and the Hadith, and understand. That is, even a blue-collar worker could become an expert on Islam. That was my goal. I would still come back to the subject of political Islam as such because it's an interesting interesting definition of what you did to it. It has its own quantification too. Right. So you quantified practically the political doctrine of Islam. So maybe you can speak more about this too. Well, Muhammad has more books than Allah does. We have two kinds of books about Muhammad. We have the Sirah, which is nothing more than a biography. And it's a big biography, 800 pages long. Then we have his Hadith, which are as a word for traditions. The shortest Hadith is war is deceit. But these are things that Muhammad said and did. Now, oddly enough, if you take the Quran, the Sirah, and the Hadith and lay them on a table, you'll discover that the Quran is the smallest book of all. As a matter of fact, it's only 14%, whereas Muhammad is 86%. So Islam is 14% Allah and 86% Muhammad. Well, this tells us where we ought to start our learning process. Most people are discouraged about Islam because they pick up that unreadable book called the Quran, and it's one of the most unreadable books ever produced. Well, it can be made readable, and that was one of my goals. Anyone can pick up my Quran and read it because I've integrated Muhammad into it. So Muhammad is necessary to start your learning of. Don't pick up the Quran and read it first. I've never seen that succeed. But one of the great things about picking up with the life of Muhammad is it's a great story. I grew up as storytellers in the rural South, and this is a fabulous story. It should be made into a movie, as a matter of fact. But the bulk of it is about what Muhammad did to the unbeliever, the Kafir. As you read it more and more, you realize that there's more in here about me, the non-believer, than there is about for the Muslim. So once again, I gave my statistics 51% of the doctrine found in Quran, Sarah Hadith, is about me and you, not about how to be a Muslim. Well, this is an oddity. Most people don't ever consider this. They think Islam is about the Muslim. No, it's about us. This, effect, this affects your political thinking because you realize, wait a minute. It also means that you should look into the political history of Islam. 
because the political history of Islam supports the doctrine. As a matter of fact, the political history of Islam is an exact rolling out of the doctrine. And we need to understand here in America and Europe, Islam is here now. So political Islam is the key to understanding Islam because it's the only part of Islam that matters to us. Everything else about going to heaven and stuff just simply doesn't matter. One interesting subject would be the element of fear. Because speaking about the political system shifts the debate from religious into political. In that moment, when I had my own experience using your methodology with politicians, opinion makers, in general public, people are dissolving the fear in the way that you even don't expect. Because when they can speak about the political system and they have it in the category of political system, you know, they are free to speak. There is a public debate. There is a free debate. Well, we can still talk about politics. That's the key. When we can no longer talk about politics, we're living in a nation that I don't want to live in. America's always had a great tradition of p political argument, political cartoons, and we need to bring this concept to Islam itself. The next thing what you have developed is the universal language, global universal language about the subject of political Islam. That every single person, regardless where they live, where they are and where they work, can speak the same language. So people don't speak about Islamism, they speak about political Islam. People don't speak about terrorism, they speak about jihad. Can you elaborate more on that? Well, part of good science is good naming. As a matter of fact, naming is critically important. For instance, we have this business of combating violent extremism. What is that? So instead, all the words that I use come from the doctrine of Islam. As a matter of fact, that's one of my criteria, is that we only speak using the words that we find in the Islamic doctrine. So this means we don't use words like Islamist or Islamophobia, because these words do not occur, occur in the doctrine. So we have to have a precise language, because fuzzy meanings gives fuzzy thoughts and means you get fuzzy conclusions. So one of the things we want to be able to do is to command the language, to give people the right words to say. This gives them a feeling of power. So proper naming is a very important part of any scientific study. Also the understanding that political Islam attacks the idea of the political left, political right, political center does not matter. Because in the doctrine of political Islam, everybody is treated as a kafir. It's next of your concepts, you know, next of your ideas is the, is the word kafir, capital K kafir. Right. And can you again speak a little bit more about that? Well, I became interested in the word kafir. What really made me pique my initial interest was, is that Muslims didn't want you to use this word. Well, this immediately makes me go, hmm, why not? So I began to realize that it was an important word. The Quran uses that word for the unbeliever. Now, Muslims don't like you to use the word, so I began to investigate where they write when they said that I am not a kafir. So I took, and used, I took a Quran and counted up every time the word kafir was used in the Arabic and discovered there were 345 times that the Quran said that I was a kafir, that I was an unbeliever. So therefore, I insist to any Muslim, I am a kafir because Allah says I'm a kafir. Not because I say I am, but because Allah says that. I would like to come back to the concept of speaking with people of different political views about the subject of political Islam. One of the key experiences I had in my life is that if you speak with somebody who is from the political left, you have to identify the ideas of the political left. If you speak with somebody from the political right, you have to identify the ideas and the core ideas of the political right and base the explanation on, on both of them. So you show to the political left or right how their core ideas are attacked by political Islam without going into any other topic. You just would like to go specifically to the subject of political Islam. This is very important insight. What we want to do is, is to discuss Islam as it affects the person. Remember, political Islam is the impact on the non-believer, the kafir. But we need to, when we're discussing this with people, and I learned this when I first started working with Islam, I found it very interesting what would cause somebody to turn on Islam. For instance, one man when he said, Muhammad didn't like dogs. Well, anybody that likes, doesn't like dogs can't be very good, so he rejects Islam on the basis of dogs. My bookkeeping accountant said, he got 20% of the war booty? What kind of religious man does that? So I begin to pay attention as to what is important to the person and then pay, tell them what Islam says about that, and it's never good. 
So one additional information to the subject of, let's say, political Islam and political views is that political Islam does not care if you are left, right or in the center. Political Islam cares for its expansion. And political Islam destroys the core ideas, views and ideological views of every single kafir political system. So there has to be the unity, there has to be the handshake between the political left and right on the subject of political Islam. They can disagree about the taxes, they can disagree about multiple other things, but they should agree on one thing and this is political Islam as such. One of the things, by the way, that I, when I'm experimenting with how to talk to someone about Islam, I ask the question, how do you feel about wife beating? Not, not well. Not well. No one does. So then I point out that Islam in, recommends wife beating. So this is an example of first finding out where they're sensitive, what is their sensitive spot, and then going to it. Because no matter what you think about politics, for instance, I have friends who are atheists, and they think, well, I don't care anything about this religion of Islam. It doesn't have anything to do with me. Well, hello, atheist friend. You might be interested to know that the Quran hates the atheist worse than it does anything else. So nobody gets left out of being abused. It's political Islam abuses everybody. I would like to come back to the subject of fear and that speaking about the political system is not the same as to speak about religion because it makes no sense and because it really does remove fear. So can you speak more about this fear removal, fear dissolvement from the, if you speak about the subject of political Islam? Well, it's very important to take away people's fear because people who are afraid can't learn anything. As a matter of fact, they will avoid learning anything that makes them afraid. So the simplicity means that they can at least know their actual content. The other thing is, is that people are afraid of being called an Islamophobe. Well, if they know the Islam, they can explain to somebody why it's legitimate to be afraid of Islam, and that doesn't make you an Islamophobe. We live in a time now when people call names easily and a lot, and people have become very sensitive about being called names, which I do not understand because you can call me the most vicious names in the world, doesn't affect me, it's not me. But we need to deal with people's fears so that they can learn Islam because it's the, one of the most critical subjects for anybody to know. Islam is going to only become more and more powerful. And when you know something, you're less afraid of it. So good knowledge helps to dispense fear. And also it means that when you're talking to your cousins and family and boyfriends or whoever else, if you know the facts of the matter, you can show them that you're not dealing with emotions here. Fear is an emotion. And what we want to do with fact-based reasoning is to skip the feeling part and go directly to the facts. I would like to say to all of you that the genius of Bill Warner is to using his methodology exactly as it is given. Because I had many possibilities to use it exactly as you gave to us. And it works. It works, it gives people the education, it removes the fear, it creates the public debate. Politicians uh, general public, people just allow themselves to speak about the subject of political Islam. So thank you for that. Well, glad to do it. It was my goal to set out. I yeah. want people to be unafraid and full of optimism, not fear.